I haven't spoken to this man in a very long time. Charlie Weiss, how are you, Coach? I'm Rich. How you doing, my man? I'm hanging in. How you been? Oh, just hang, hanging down here in South Florida, roughing the roughing the rough weather, you know. I bet. About 80, 85 and sunny today, you know, another miserable day. I bet. Soak it all in, Charlie Weiss. Um, look, first, first question is, when did you meet Bill Parcells for the first time? When did that go down? Oh, I, you know, met him officially in 1989. You know, I had bumped into him at the shore several times. but <laughs> Jersey at Shore, that, right? At, at, at that time, I was just like a fan. So, you know, like I wasn't like I went up and talked to him. But in 89, I'd say, is when we first met. And then how did you wind up um, with him on his staff? How did that go? Well, well what happened is I was – Doing some work for uh, some work for pro personnel director Tim Rooney, and then after after that season that I did this work for Tim Rooney, um, Lamar Leachman, who was the defensive line coach, left and went to Detroit. Romeo Cornell moved to defensive line. Mike Sweatman uh, moved to the special teams coach. So they had an assistant special team slash defensive quality control position that they were hiring for. So he interviewed a bunch of guys and was complaining to Tim that he can't find the right guy. And Tim said, well, you had the right guy in here last su- all last summer. So Tim recommended to me to Bill, and then I interviewed with Bill, and he hired me. And then, obviously, you were with them uh, there with the Giants and then uh, the Patriots and then to the Jets and then went with Belichick to the Patriots uh, in 2000. When did you realize uh, that Tom Brady was pretty special for the first time? When do you re- recall that, well, Charlie? Uh, well, we had, we had an inkling that he had a chance – his first year, but he wasn't playing at all his first year. As a matter of fact, he was our fourth quarterback. And he only, I think he threw three passes all year. And he got in one game, he threw, had one completion for about six yards, and that, that was about it. But the, the next year in training camp, he was fighting for number two with Damon Eward, who we had picked up from Miami. And he beat him out by a hair. It wasn't like... Tommy was clearly the second best guy, but it was he beat him out just by a little bit to back up to back up Drew. Drew goes down, Tommy goes in. You know, we kind of take baby steps as we go through the year. And then about midway through the year, there was like a turning point where we really thought we had something special because we were playing New Orleans. We were down by 10 or 11 in the fourth quarter. We came back and scored twice, you know, to tie it up. We got it to overtime. And on, on our first offensive play in overtime, New Orleans brought a blitz that we had practiced against a, a, multiple times in a week, but we hadn't seen once in a game. And the, the kid checks off. He audibles, throws a ball 55 yards down the field, defensive pass interference. We end up kicking, you know, Benetieri kicked the field goal. We win the game. But the fact that mentally that a kid with that little experience could make a play, could make a call like that, we, we figured we might have something special. And then, of, of course, later on in the uh, campaign, you're in the Superdome in New Orleans. Vinatieri does kick a game winner for the Super Bowl in a in a drive that was very famous for many reasons, including for those watching at home in the last Summerall Madden Super Bowl uh, that they called together. Madden's like they they should take a knee here and go to overtime because this kid, you know, it's his first rodeo. Essentially, is what he's saying. Did you and Belichick have any sense of potentially taking your foot off the brake in that Super Bowl as you were dialing up the plays no, there? The- no, the only ones involved there, to be honest with you, were Belichick and I and Tommy and Drew. So the four of us sat on the sideline. And we all knew that St. Louis had, had had taken over the momentum and tied the game with two fourth-quarter touchdowns. So we figured we should at least give it a shot. We started off conservatively. Of course, Drew was saying, just go out there and sling it, <laughs> like any veteran quarterback would say. 
but um, we went out conservative at first. But then after after we threw a little flare pass to the left to J.R. Redmond, and he got out of bounds at about the 40, 45 yard line. You know, we became, we we got more aggressive to try to get down there and get in the field goal range. And then, of course, two more Super Bowls came. Uh, Charlie Weiss here on the Rich Eisen Show, offensive coordinator for those. Uh, Patriots championship years, including the last time that there were back-to-back champions in, in the NFL right here on the Rich Eisen Show. And now uh, Brady at age 42, about to be 43, is as amazing and as relevant as ever, the biggest free agent quarterback that we've ever seen uh, because Peyton Manning, at least when he was a free agent, he was having uh, concerns over how his surgically repaired neck would do. When was the last time you texted with Tom, Charlie? Well, I mean, I texted him. Uh, I sent him a text yesterday, but I mean, I texted him last week just to say how comical I thought it was that you know that he that he was the story, and then he texted back to me. He goes, "No one knows anything," and I said, "Well, I mean, not according to all the experts, they all seem to think they have the answer." And he goes, "Well, then go clean it up." So that's what I did. I went on radio that day and yeah. said, look it. I go, I didn't talk to Tommy. We traded texts. He told me that no one knows anything. And believe and believe me, I would not have said that no one knows anything if I truly felt that he already knew what he was doing. I really believe that he doesn't know what he's doing yet. I think I'm sure he's done the research because he, he does his due diligence. But, um, but, even though he's done research, I don't think he has any idea what he's doing yet. And I agree with you. I don't think so either. But uh, you would definitely be uh, expert not only uh, in uh, what Brady's mindset would be, and you, you got that straight from the horse's mouth via text just a few days ago, but the tendencies of Belichick, you must know those inside and out, and the sense that Robert Kraft is not going to be – placing any uh, of his influence towards the end on making something happen. He's just going to delegate and leave this up to Bill. What What do you think Bill's mindset is going into this whole scenario, Charlie? Well, you got, well, you got to remember, Bill, even though hey, look, he's well aware of all the nuances and, and the ramifications and the relationships and the legacy, you know, he's, a well, he's well aware of all those things. It's not like he's oblivious to those. But Bill has a very, very unique ability to separate church and state. And by that, I mean, you know, when it comes down to making a business decision, he makes a business decision. So, you know, now as this timing has changed with the CBA vote and the tags and, you know, when free agency actually starts, I think the window has shrunk into uh, basically a Sunday, Sunday, Monday, uh, a Sunday money r- really conversation. You know, once the CEBA is approved, which I believe it's going to be, you'll know you'll know what the rules are. Or if it wasn't approved, you know what the rules are going to be. Right. And then, you know, by the by the 18th, they have to have made this decision. The two of them, because after the 18th, I, I don't think it becomes. Uh, it it doesn't seem to make, fit financially once that thirty thirteen and a half million dollar cap hit comes, and then you'd have to tag on 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 top of that. That doesn't seem to make much sense. Yeah, and that kicks in once the new league year officially begins, and and um, that's what does absolutely make it, as you point out, something that has to happen before that. And obviously the window about what the rules are going to be has made that window even smaller, as you just pointed out. Charlie Weiss here on the Rich Eisen Show. What do you make, however, of the notion that Tom would like it to be church and state? He wants to feel the love here, that it's more than just a business decision for him. So why is it a business decision yeah. specifically for New England and yeah. how the, that may meet, Charlie? Oh, what do you think of that? You, you, you don't know that. You don't know that, and I don't know that. You know, we don't know. We don't know for sure what he's thinking. I mean, it's not like he's sitting there telling people what he's thinking. Right. I mean, the only people he's talked to, you know, is his agent, you know, his wife, and, you know, maybe his business partner. But other than that, he's not telling anyone what he's thinking. He's not sharing that with people. 
even the people he's closest with. I mean, they'll find out when everyone else finds out. So when everyone acts like, well, this is what Tommy wants, he's never told anyone that. You've never heard it from his mouth. That's true. You've never heard it from the people who represent him. You've just heard it from people like you and I, Rich, that we have our conjecture of what he wants, but we really don't know for sure. What if what he wants is to get paid? I mean, not that I think that that's the most important thing, because from knowing him, the most important thing to him is winning another ring. So wherever he goes, he wants to be in a position where he can win another ring, you know, whether that be New England or somewhere else. You know, but 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 at the end of the day, unless you hear it from him, or unless you hear it from Bill, all that is is conjecture. And there's just a lot, I guess, a lot of uh, empty time to fill before then, right, Charlie? To try and figure out how what tendencies are here and what people have said in the past and how sensitive they have been uh, to the subject matter, and and it just leaves us all here to to speculate. Um, where... Hey, there's there's going to be people that are right because everyone's guessing something. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, so there are going to be a handful of people that are right in their guess. But, but I think that Bill's continuing to do his work. I think Tommy's continuing to do his work. I think that they'll have a meeting of the minds. Once the CBA uh, is decided, they'll have a meeting of the mind. Bill will say, here's, you know, here, here's, here's, what, here's the game plan. And then Tommy is either going to say, uh, he can come back and say, well, here's what I like. And if they can come to an agreement, they will. And if they won't, they'll, they'll shake hands and say thank you for everything and move on their way. This is, not going to be a, this is not going to be a cold, miserable breakup or anything like that. I think that they've both been around for a long time and have worked very well together and had huge success. And I think that I mean, this will not be one of those ones where everyone tells everyone to go to hell and walks away. That's not the way this will happen. So we shouldn't. Pay... I personally, go ahead. I personally hope he ends up just staying in New England, but I don't know whether or not that that's going to be the way this is going to play out. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just, I just feel that maybe after twenty years, uh, everybody wants to hear a different voice. That's just the sense I get. And again, you're right. Tom's not telling this to anybody. He's certainly not telling it to me. It's just what I hear and what I guess and what I suppose and just uh, trying to read into the fact that we have reached this point, right? I mean, that the Patriots could have put something on the table over the last several weeks and just didn't. Or we do... You know, the one thing that, the one thing that is cool, though, Rich... Yeah, Charlie. If he does, if he does go, this is, going to be, this is going to be exciting. Because if he does go... Okay, what do the Patriots do? Is Stidham their quarterback? Do they go get a veteran quarterback? What do they do? And what happens where, wherever he goes, that starts this whole trickle-down effect where now all, all the pieces start falling in places around the league. So for this time of year to have one guy be able to have that type of a ripple effect, I mean, that, 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 that intrigues me. I'm kind of excited Either way, I'm kind of excited to see what happens. I agree. Charlie Weiss, a few more minutes left with the uh, the, the uh, ball coach from back in the day uh, in the NFL and, of course, Notre Dame right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Um, which quarterback coming out of college would you take first? You got Burrow, you got Tua with uh, supposedly a clean hip. Herbert has a big upside. Jordan Love, uh, anybody that you've seen that you say that that's the, that's the guy out there? Well, I'm a, Tua, I'm a Tua fan. I mean, and no one can deny – the year that Burrow had. It was phenomenal. And not only did he play great, but he played great against all the good teams. You know, he you know, he beat all those teams in the SEC West, you know, and then they go through the tournament. They roll through that, including rolling rolling over Clemson. No one can can deny the year he had. And I can understand why um, you know, a, a, a homegrown kid, state of Ohio, since he picking, I could see why they take him. I'm a Tua fan. You know, I've no, I've known more about Tua. You know, uh, my kid had been at Alabama for a couple of years. One of his assignments when he was at Alabama was to go out to Hawaii at the, at the big football camp they have out there. And make sure those other colleges don't steal him away from Alabama. So I mean. <laughs> You know, seriously, it, it, 
You know, imagine that assignment. You're a, a 21 year old kid, yeah. and Nick says, "Don't don't screw it up and let him go somewhere else." No pressure, no pressure or anything like that. You know. Uh, oh, wow. But I, I'm a Tua fan. Well, I know. Uh, I know what everyone in Alabama thinks of him. You know, especially in that office in, in Tuscaloosa, and watching him play and knowing what they say. He has that it factor. Well, Kevin, and, Falk, Kevin Falk, who you know very well, Charlie, is at LSU, and he's told Daniel Jeremiah, my colleague on NFL Network and others, that Burrow reminds him exactly like Brady in terms of makeup, in terms of heart, in terms of also uh, uh, mechanics. Do you see any similarities? Do you see that? Well, my, only, my only concern is one-year starter. That, that's my only concern. You know, when, when, one, you, when you've done it for a year – it's different than when you've done it for multiple years. So I, I, I love the year the kid had. I can't argue that. But Kevin, who I love, one of my favorite players right. that I ever coached, there's no reason for him to say that if he didn't believe that. Right. Okay, but, but I, that, that to me is secondhand knowledge. All I can go, you know, when my kid tells me, you know, you know that the kid has, has the it factor, you know, then he has the it factor. What if I threw Trevor Lawrence into the mix? Would you take him over anybody else? Uh, the kid from Clemson. He, he might be. Good. He might go above all of them, but but he's not in the mix. Nah. So we don't have to do that. Uh, so this we is, don't have to do this that. This is sports talk radio, Charlie. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> uh, hey man, uh, this is fun fun chat. Before I let you go, I got a couple minutes left. You tell somebody that might be out there a millennial. That's watching us. We have our, our feeds on YouTube uh, as as well. Uh, Parcells, what it was like? Safe for work story for Parcells. What it was okay, like? Okay, um, give me a good one. Uh, um, it's it's one of my first weeks. One of my first weeks on the job. Um, we're having a staff meeting now. Earlier that day, we had had a, a special team segment where I was back with the punt returners, who were Dave Meggett, Mark Ingram, and Stephen Baker. Okay. So this was 1990. So um, Mike Swetman, who's the special teams coach, he was working with the long snapper and the punter during this drill. So he wasn't watching the returners. He was watching the long snappers and the punter. So we're now in a staff meeting, and Parcells goes to Swetman. All right, so rank these punt returners for me. Well, Swet hadn't gotten an opportunity to even watch, you know, watch them catch them yet. He had, we hadn't had a chance to watch the video yet. Yeah. So he was stumbling and bumbling a little bit about, you know, what the answer was. So because I was back there, I said, hey, Coach, uh, Megan's obviously first. Ingram's, Ingram's clearly second. Baker's third. So Parcell stops the, stops the meeting and looks down at me at the end of the table on the right-hand side and says, You've been in the league for five minutes. So why don't you just sit there and shut the hell up? No one cares what you think. So needless to say, I got humbled very quickly in my, my rookie my rookie season. And I appreciate I think you cleaned it up for me too, didn't you, Charlie, right? You cleaned that uh, story up. I a did. Bit? I did. <laughs> I did. I did clean it up. But you me. were right though. Uh, you were right in your assessment though, correct? Were you correcting your assessment? That's not that's not the point. <laughs> the point was, Charlie, thanks the for the time. Is, yeah. When you earn your keep, then you can open your mouth, but not until then. That's the point. Thanks for the time, Charlie. We'll do this uh, do this again. There's a lot of fun. All right, take care. You got it right back at you. It's been a long time since I chatted with Charlie Weiss right here on the Rich House. That was awesome.